and welcome to the Oncology Education Series for Caregivers at the John Wayne Cancer Clinics at Providence St. John's Health Center. So we watched the neuro session and they have a pretty high bar, but I think we're going to blow them out of the water, I hope. <laughs> Their slides were really nice, but Ann and I had to scramble last night. But um, we're better than neuro. But I, I, re I, re I remember they said that, uh, you know, it's a team effort. I think they started with that. It really is. You guys, without you guys and us working very closely together, the level of care could never be what it is to these patients. It really is an extraordinary place. Even though we're small and cramped, and at times we might say that we're disorganized, we're getting less disorganized, we're moving forward. But I, we know that we deliver incredible care because of the synergy between you all and us and the advanced practice providers and the, it's really the chemistry of the surgeons and the medical oncologists in the same space. This is extraordinarily unusual. Most uh, bigger cancer centers are very siloed with regard to how surgeons and medical oncologists interact. But the field is demanding, moving so quickly, and it's really demanding that we work together. But I think we're way ahead of the game in that regard. So thank you. I know it's really complicated to try to schedule multiple appointments all the same day and add-ons. And, you know, there's a lot that goes into this. And we're going to make that better, and we have some plans to try to work with a company called Ronin to build software that actually really uh, leads to, you know, helps this vision of interdisciplinary. Uh, the system isn't really set up to do quite what we're trying to accomplish, but you're at the forefront of making history. So I want to just talk a little bit of a, give an overview of this disease melanoma. Anna's going to talk maybe a little more about how we approach patients as a team and other things, but you know, this is really an extraordinary story in oncology. Uh, melanoma used to be the bad child of cancer. Literally, people would say it gave cancer a bad name because it was a relatively rare disease in the scope of major cancers, but it was the deadliest cancer known to man. A four millimeter melanoma on the skin led to 50% mortality, whether you had lymph nodes or not. Really extraordinary. So this is a very virulent cancer that affected people, affects people two, two decades before most of the other major cancers. If you look at breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate and lung, the big four, the median age of onset is 60, 65. Melanoma, it's 45 to 50. So you're, these are people in the primes of their lives, not that you're not in the prime at 65, as I'm getting close to that age, but, um, but when you're 40 and 50 with small children and you have a devastating disease that Historically, up until about 10 years ago, had a survival of six months, median, average, and a five-year survival of zero. So I just want to, that's melanoma. Now, today, 10 years later, the average survival went from six months to four years, and the cure rate now went from zero to 50, five zero percent. Extraordinary. And now, it's now front and center in cancer. No one, in fact... It, you know, in someone who develops metastatic, it's better to have metastatic melanoma than breast cancer, lung, and any of the other solid tumors other than testicular cancer. So childhood leukemias, of course, we cure 80, 90 plus percent. All the other solid tumors, once it's metastasized, everyone essentially dies. Melanoma now, 50% are cured. Testicular cancer is the only other exception where we cure very, like Lance Armstrong, we cure people even with brain metastasis. But melanoma is right there. So I want to just briefly talk about the stages of the disease. There's four stages. The surgeons often see patients in stage one and two, and the medical oncologist stage three and four, but we sort of interact now. Stage one and two means the disease is confined to the skin, uh, and it just is a matter of how deep it is in the skin. Stage three means it's moved to the lymph nodes that drain that area of skin. And then stage four means it's out in the blood and seeding the distant organ sites. So one, two, three, four. One and two we manage surgically. And those are mainly, melanoma is one of the few skin cancers where you can't just get a real tiny little margin around it. You gotta get a big hunk, about one to two centimeters to clear because melanoma can spit out little satellites even when you can't see the, them. So our surgeons always take either one or two centimeters around the lesion, 
and then depending on how deep it is. The deepers get two centimeters, the thinner ones get one centimeter. And then they often check the lymph node through what's called a sentinel lymph node procedure. So that's where they inject a little blue dye and radioisotope at the tumor. They trace it to where the first lymph node would be if there was a metastasis, and then they just take out that lymph node, not the rest. And the data has shown now that that's very, very sufficient. They don't need any additional, it saves patients lots of extra surgery. Okay, so that's stage one and two. So, and then once they have stage three melanoma, meaning it's in the lymph nodes, but not out in the rest of the body. These are what we call high risk patients. And now we're offering them, there's some treatment, immune treatment to prevent them from coming back. And that, we didn't used to have anything for stage three melanoma. Now we can give them either oral drugs for a year or an immune drug for a year and reduce their risk of recurrence by 50%, which is extraordinary. And then once it moves to stage four, that means it's out in the lung or liver, it's spread through the bloodstream. That's where we use lots of different immune drugs or these, what we call targeted therapy, and I'm gonna talk about that. So this revolution in melanoma um, is really a revolution of cancer, but melanoma, think of it as the leading disease that has defined this revolution. And it's centered around two different treatments, immunotherapy and targeted therapy. So historically with cancer, we would use chemotherapy as our main treatment for people once things had metastasized. And in most, unlike leukemia, where it works very good, or lymphoma, or testicular cancer, for all the other cancers, it had marginal benefits at best. Wasn't curing anybody, making them pretty sick, because it's like a nuclear bomb approach. You know, you're just hitting the whole, anything that's dividing, that's what chemotherapy, and, and cancer cells divide quicker than others, so there's a lot of collateral damage. But these two therapies, immune therapy and targeted, have changed the ball game, not only in melanoma, but across all cancer now. So the immunotherapy concept is you don't really care about the cancer. You need what's the problem with cancer is that there are T cells, body, your body's own immune, that aren't doing their job, which is supposed to be preventing cancer and then containing it. And obviously, if it's spreading in you, your T cells aren't doing the job. So these immune treatments are all about activating these T cells, bringing them back to life, these middle-aged, exhausted T cells, bringing them back into their adolescent youth so that they can get rid of the cancer. Targeted therapy is all about, instead of chemo, which is very nonspecific, it's all about um, finding what gene mutations the tumor is vulnerable to, and then actually targeting therapy to that mutation in a gene that the, that the cancer cell overexpresses. So we all have normal genes, and then our genes can be mutated. Some of those genes are very fundamental to how a cancer cell grows and spreads. So what we're doing with these oral targeted therapies is blocking these genes, these mutated genes, which are highly specific for the cancer, not normal cells. And so it's like a cruise missile going after the cancer. And now we use these together sometimes. So think about using a cruise missile to attack the cancer cell and then activating the T cells at the same time to wipe it out. So this is the types of therapies that melanoma has brought to the forefront. So this just uh, hit all three, keep it advanced. So this is just that sort of wave of, of chemotherapy, genomics, which is the targeted mutational therapy, and then the last course is immunotherapy, which is front and center and my total passion. Next. This just shows you the targeted therapy in melanoma on the right, that, or this, on the left, this represents a cancer cell, and you can see it has these proteins, NRAS, BRAF, MEK, and ERK. These are a series of sequential proteins that a cancer cell uses to grow and spread and proliferate. And when BRAF is mutated, it, it really, that that pathway gets slickened and everything just keeps moving through lots of proliferative proteins. That's how a cancer cell survives. Some cells have this, everyone has this pathway, but when it's mutated, it really greases the wheels and allows a cancer cell to really do its harm. So what we're doing with these oral drugs is blocking two different, the BRAF and the MEK in sequence and shutting that pathway down. And now the cancer cell's starved of its machinery in which it uses to try to grow. Next. 
So let's now go to the immune system. What's fascinating about the immune system is it's very powerful, it can adapt, and most importantly, it has memory. When we have viruses and we get exposed to things, our T cells react, they clear the virus, and then they go back into memory. They don't go away, they go to memory. And as a kid, growing up as a child, you get exposed to a lot. That creates what we call a huge repertoire of T cells that then go into memory and wait for the next uh, advance. That's why as an adult, you tend to get less sick with each re-challenge to a virus. It's because your T cells have already been sort of trained on that virus and then they don't go away, they go into memory and they wait for the next challenge. That's why kids before the age of six months are very vulnerable and that's why maternal milk is very important because passive antibodies from the mother holds things in check. It takes about six months for the body's thymus gland, which is where the T cells are educated, to get enough of them in place for the, the little child to have some defense. So neonates are very vulnerable to infection. But then once they develop their T cell repertoire and they get exposed to viruses, it, then they get uh, stabilized. All right, next. So this just, I wanna just take you through this, this slide. So the tumor is on the upper left. It turns out cer certain tumors are very much more visible to the immune system than other tumors. And it turns out melanoma is one of the most visible. That's why these immune therapies work. It's because with ultraviolet radiation, skin damage to the, to the, to the which is how melanomas originate, there's lots of mutations. So the, think about the melanoma cell. All, mel all cancer have fingerprints on the surface that define it. The more mutations you have, the, the more visible, the more that cell looks different to the immune system. Remember, immune cells are trying to sort out what's self and what's foreign. And they, they're supposed to get rid of anything that's a threat that's foreign, but they're not supposed to attack self. So melanoma just happens to be a very visible cancer cell, thankfully, and that's why the immune therapies work so well. Lung cancer, it's interesting, smokers who get lung cancer, much more visible because all the toxins of smoke create a lot more of a finger pit, uh, a pattern on the cell that's recognized. Now there's an epidemic in non-smokers with lung cancer. They don't respond well because they look too much like normal lung cells. However, they have mutations often to their pathway called EGFR. So now we're using oral therapies to target the non lung cancer smokers, and then the immune to do. So this is an example. In melanoma, we get to do both because there's lots of mutations in melanoma, and you can use either targeted or immune. But this just shows you, so the tumor on the right is constantly releasing, and it tries not to, but when it's under stress, it releases some of these foreign proteins in red. They get picked up by some of your immune cells called the dendritic cells that take them over to the T cell, which is in blue at the right. And now this T cell gets primed. Normally it's resting and it gets activated and then these activated T cells start to attack the tumor. And you can actually, we have videos uh, where you can actually watch these T cells attacking the tumor. So that's the mechanism of what we're doing. So we're trying to augment these T cells so that we get more of an army of T cells in the battle. That's what our therapies are trying to do. Next. So basically, this is a complicated slide, but I want to just, so there's basically been two major fundamental breakthroughs uh, of therapy. One is called CTLA-4 blockade, and one is called PD-1 blockade. CTLA-4, we were the, one of the first groups in the world to put this in humans in 2000, and that led to cure rates of one in four of melanoma just by activating these T cells by blocking one of these receptors on the T cell. The other is PD-1, which also has a very powerful way of activating these T cells. And then when we use the two drugs, sometimes in the clinic we're using just PD-1 drugs or just CTLA-4 drugs or the combination. So when we use the combination now in melanoma, we cure about 50% of patients. This is people with lung, liver, bone, brain metastasis. And so what it's doing is it's basically activating these T cells both early on. The CTLA-4 works, think about it as building more of a new army of T cells, whereas PD-1 is all about making exhausted T cells come back to life. So they synergize beautifully because you're both, you know, the battle is, is won by helping the troops that are already there 
and bringing fresh troops in. So these two uh, drugs, uh, CTLA-4 inhibitors and PD-1 inhibitors, are working separately on the T cell, but they're doing the same essential thing, which is to generate a bigger army, a more forceful army, resurrecting the army that's there, and then unleashing it onto the cancer. So in melanoma, we cure 50%. With lung cancer now, we're curing about 20, 25% with these drugs. Bladder, kidney, almost every cancer has has a cure rate right now with one or the combination of these drugs. Yeah. But on the right, on this, so here's your T cell, and here are these, these, um, these markers that we're blocking with our drugs in the clinic. And I've just told you about those two red drugs, CTLA-4 and PD-1. So we're blocking those two and curing 50% of melanoma. But look at all these other markers we haven't even started to explore. In fact, we now have a clinical trial with LAG3, um, and so, LAG3, which is down here, and others. So we're only scratching the surface right now, and yet we're producing these high cure rates. So you can only imagine as we start to, the, the, the proteins on the right are breaks to the T cell. So by blocking a break, you're sort of bringing the, and the ones on the right are like the accelerator to the T cell. So you can do two things with new drugs. You can block the breaks, or you can push the accelerator. So we're going to be doing all kinds of Ford versus Ferrari for the <laughs> immune system in the coming, coming uh, years. OK? This is what we're trying to accomplish. On the right is a tumor that is invisible to the immune system. The red is the tumor. Green on the left are T cells. What we're trying to accomplish, when, if, the, if the cancer is invisible, there's no way the T cells can can it not? So with our treatments, we're really creating this intense T cell reaction. And that's what we want on all of our patients, because that leads to eradication of tumor. Next. This just gives you an example. This was one of my early patients with CTLA-4. If you see on the left, they were screening. And then at 12 weeks, you can see the tumor on the skin is actually getting worse. And at the beginning, we thought, oh my gosh, what that is is actually those T cells have raced in and caused more inflammation. So it's called pseudo progression. It actually looks worse, but it's actually not. So we have to re educate patients sometimes that you have to be patient. You're building an army of T cells and sending them to battle. It takes three to six months sometimes. So at three months, it looks like the patient's progressing. Look at that. Just with two weeks later, and the sweet spot seems to be around 12 weeks. Just two weeks later, look how much has regressed. And then four weeks later, it's essentially gone. And you can see now they're cured of their melanoma. Because once the immune system attacks, it's incredible how durable it is. So it's, it's, it's magical. OK, next. So I just want to talk a little bit. When we're in the clinic, the reason why it's really important to monitor these patients closely is you know, there's a balance here between too much immune activation and too little. Obviously. If there's too little activation, the tumor grows. But if there's too much, that may be good in the sense that the tumor gets better. But if the T cells start attacking the normal tissues in addition to the cancer, then that's a major problem. And, and these drugs can cause life-threatening side effects. So it's really important we keep patients in the loop. They need to own their symptoms, not underestimate their symptoms, report them readily have good support, and be able to allow us to monitor them carefully. Because there can be severe attack of the colon, the liver, the lungs, even the heart or the brain with these drugs. Now, the good news is we have pretty easy ways of managing this by giving them prednisone, a steroid that just settles the immune system down. But, um, but it is a little bit of a, uh, of a dance. And it's very different than chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, you know, they're more uh, understandable, and, and, the, and when things happen are quite understandable. The counts drop at a certain time. The nausea and vomiting is associated. It's all very cookie cutter. Um, but this, sometimes the immune system can be quiet and then suddenly just take off against the patient's normal tissues, and you have to be ready. And patients have to understand that more treatment, uh, more treatment at the time at that they're having major side effects isn't going to help them. Because a lot of they, they're in a mindset sometimes that if you stop my treatment, I'm going to die of the cancer. But the, actually, it's just the opposite. If you get severe symptoms, you're actually destined to do better. 
because for the obvious reason that you still, and, and you could die of a side effect if you keep giving more treatment. So it's a real negotiation and frame shift for patients to understand they need to report the symptoms. We won't stop the treatment unless we think it's medically needed. But if you have to stop the treatment, you actually will do better and it may shorten your need for any additional treatment. Some of our most severe side effects may just get one or two doses and be long-term survivors and never need another one, another dose of anything. So it's, it's a real uh, team effort to make sure patients are aware. And this is where you can all be very helpful if you're interacting with patients to reassure them they should communicate their symptoms, that more is not always better in those settings, and safety is first. And, and so that's a really important part. What we're doing in this clinic is pretty challenging, and, and I get it. So I think we should all acknowledge that and, uh, and pat ourselves on the back. What we're trying to do is this synergistic patient-centered cancer care model that rarely exists. People talk about interdisciplinary you know, uh, care, patient-centered care, but it's usually one discipline at a time. It's not quite like this. Even, and when there are multidisciplinary clinics at bigger centers, it's like the first day the patient comes for their initial consult, everybody sees them, but then they go off to one area and then pretty much in sequence see different doctors. The model we're trying to do here is they see us all often at the same time at the beginning, but then there's longitudinal synergy, you know, where surgeons are staying active radiation therapy, and there may be a quarterback to the team. Often in more advanced disease, it's the medical oncologist. In early disease, it's the surgeon. So there needs to be a quarterback. Well, we've got all these other disciplines coming in and out to the, to the trajectory of this longitudinal care. But to the, to the extent that we succeed, it's going to be a really, really extraordinary advance, I think, in cancer. So because we've got the medical oncologist, radiation, I think Anna may talk about clinical trials. So we have a clinical trial team that's involved, surgeons, and then we have our fellows all interacting and touching the patient frequently at the same visit. Next. I think this is the last. So why is this important? So we basically in the upper left is patient care. But we know that even with the best treatments that we have available right now, for example, melanoma, 50% are dying with with stage four disease. Now that's, that's still a high number. It feels uh, not as big as it used to be, obviously, but still we have a long way to go. So there are lots of unsolved treatment needs. And this is where both our clinical research team and our laboratory team across it, all these specimens that come and go, you know, um, we're collecting on these patients. Many of them are participating in what we call our biorepository, where we're following how they're doing not necessarily as part of a clinical trial, but then we're collecting data and their blood and urine and their tissues so that going forward we can, we can make new discoveries that will help bring new therapies. So this is sort of the continuum of unsolved. We're not just here to give standard of care. We want to push the field forward. That requires laboratory and clinical trials research that then hopefully come back to improve patient care. I think that may be... So that's it for me, and then I'm going to let Anna give a little talk. Any questions about what I've said? No. Good. <laughs> I must have made it very clear. All right, thanks, guys. We'll have questions after. Yeah. So my name is Anna Rocha, I'm a nurse practitioner, and I have had the distinct privilege of working with Dr. Day and his excellent, excellent team for the last almost year and a half. In 1991, the John Wayne Cancer Institute launched a unique collaboration with St. John's Health Center, now world-renowned for state-of-the-art cancer research and education. With our multidisciplinary team, we provide whole-person, comprehensive, an individualized approach for people with cancer. Just to review, the biology of a cancer cell, Dr. Wagley and the neuro-oncology team spoke in the last episode on how cancer develops. Can anyone tell me what is the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell? It abnormally divides. A cancer cell does not die automatically, such as a normal cell. It also tends to travel to other locations outside of the area. 
and which is called metastasis. And it also continues to mutate and to change and to grow. How does cancer spread? Cancer spreads to other parts of the body using different channels through the bloodstream or the lymphatic system. This means that if you have breast cancer and it goes to the brain, that you have breast cancer that has now metastasized to the brain. It does not mean that you have breast cancer and brain cancer. We see all different types of cancer, breast, pancreatic, cholangiocarcinoma, and esophageal. But it isn't called the melanoma program for nothing. Melanoma is the most serious form of skin cancer. It is the fifth most common in can cancer in men and women, and the incidence increases with age. The average age of people diagnosed with melanoma is about 63. The rates of melanoma have been rising for the last 30 years. So what can melanoma look like? What we look for is asymmetry, change in border or color, diameter larger than a pencil eraser, and evolution or change over time. They are the A, B, C, Ds, and E of melanoma. Since we live in sunny Southern California, this is something that we see quite often. So it is very important to see your dermatologist at least once a year. Be sure to use sun protection when you're outdoors. In treating melanoma, we use a team approach. So this multidisciplinary team really relies on every person. And so to quote Phil Jackson, the strength of the team is each individual member and the strength of each member is the team. And included in this team is the patient and their family. Leading this multidisciplinary approach is Dr. Stephen O'Day, Medical Oncology and Executive Director of the Cancer Institute. And we have our surgical oncologist, Dr. Richard Esner, Dr. Trevin Fisher, and Dr. Leland Foshag. Also part of the team is Christine Boley, nurse practitioner, and myself, Anna Rocha, nurse practitioner. And the people who help support us every day in meeting the needs of patients are Stephanie Ochoa, Samantha, Ronald Ross, Giselle, Brenda, Mary, and Christina, all essential components of our team. Our focus is really excellence in cancer care, remembering the compassion, knowing that we are on the front lines, and sometimes we do get caught up in the day-to-day -day tasks um, and sometimes walking around with blinders on, but we always must remember to be present, um, to smile, to be kind. We are here to serve. Um, and oftentimes we have to be aware of the perception. Um, you know, we may be on the phone communicating with another provider, uh, but sometimes that may come across as not working or maybe uh, on part of social media. Uh, we also really pride ourselves on the intake process. We want to focus on consistency across the board. There are many procedures that take place in the cancer clinic, and so it's important that every new person that comes on board have the resources available to them and the education. And no matter how busy we get day to day, we should always remember to smile, be kind, and remember that we are here to serve. Some resources available to you are listed here and can be found at the www.stjohnscancer.org. This is the John Wayne Cancer Institute webpage, and you can see that we have urology and urologic oncology, endocrine tumors and disorders, our melanoma program, our minimally invasive chest surgery and thoracic surgical oncology. We have brain tumors and neuroscience, gynecologic oncology, gastrointestinal and hepatobiliary tumors, and translational research. We 
can be a resource for you. So ask us, what are some topics you'd like to learn more about? And let your leadership know if you'd like to learn more about what our cancer center has to offer, you can also go to our website. We sometimes tend to be siloed in our own specialties, but we always must remember that we work and must collaborate as a team. Additional resources are listed here. The National Cancer Institute, American Cancer Society, the Melanoma Research Foundation, Clinical Trials website, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology. What I love about the John Wayne Cancer Clinic is, you know, it is a smaller cancer center, but there is so much dedication and so much passion for helping the vulnerable. Uh, we really, we may be small, but we know how to pack a punch and we really could not do what we do on a day-to-day -day basis without your support and your help. So I just want to thank everyone in the Cancer Center. Uh, you are all invaluable to this program. So thank you. You know, we're developing a pretty robust psychosocial care program. Uh, and, you know, we have some very talented social workers in the clinic, and they're going to be more and more the lead partners in helping us assess and, and triage patients. There's a lot of distress with cancer, and um, often it can come at, at predictable times, like right around the diagnosis, uh, or when they come, interestingly, when they come off treatment, uh, even if they're in good shape, sometimes that's very stressful because they're not getting, and then obviously with bad news towards the end of, the, of life, it can be really, really stressful. So we have sort of predictable patterns, but we can also, patients can develop stress and anxiety and depression around other times. So it's really important as a team, that we, we're gonna be more um, uh, intensive with some of our screening, but you as a part of our team, if you see distress or, or anxiety with family members that seems out of proportion or just, you know, please convey it to the appropriate social work or nursing or physician staff so that we can be, because we don't always, sometimes are not always aware. You know, it's remarkable. The majority of patients um, handle this extraordinarily well. And it's what, and when, they, and they have good support. Um, and, and often it's, it, when it is a problem, it's more of an adjustment disorder, what we call to, to the stress. So it's understanding, uh, very different than more serious mental illness. There, that happens too, and there are patients who have pre-existing mental illness that also get cancer. So we need to be aware of that. But, but so much of it is understandable, and we need to normalize it and acknowledge it for pain, because it's part of a resiliency, you know, to be able to sort of get the stress and process it. It would be un sort of unusual not to, is the way I, I, t I tend to look at it. And the patient who has like no signs or symptoms of anxiety, you often worry that there's, there's complete denial or something. So the point is, we have this developing program. Um, we want you to be part of that because psychosocial health is really more than just interacting with the doctor. It's, and we touch people so many different ways. And it's all about compassion and, and wanting to make sure that that's not being neglected uh, in, in lieu of treatments, because it's all very important. And people who get help with managing those kinds of concerns often will do better. So anyway, stay tuned for more. That program may be giving, uh, I'm sure, one of these talks too, but I want to give a shout out to them. Any other questions about what we do? Yeah, somebody in the back. Sorry? Okay. Sure. So, um, could we? Why don't you just? Yeah. Why don't Why don't everybody stand up and turn and face the camera? Hunter. All right. So let's start with the front row there. Um, you got Stephanie. Why don't you stand? Stephanie, I'm the Dr. Nays medical assistant, um, and I do the blood work, uh, medication, rooming the patients, and um, yeah, I work really hand in hand with Anna and Christine and Dr. O'Day. 
been brought up? I'm um, Stephanie's assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so Rob, yes. and, and I, and, and, okay. Okay. Sasha. Okay. I'm Sasha, and I'm a study coordinator who works in clinical trial with Dr. Adey with his melanoma and other solid tumors, and that is all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mary. I do all the authorizations for um, the infusion and the scans, and also help with scheduling for Dr. Adey, Dr. Ezra, and Dr. Chidelsky. I'm also an administrative associate. I work now along with Dr. Richard Gensner, uh, scheduling, and along with Dr. O'Day and Dr. Ferrer. Oh, and I'm Giselle. I work with Dr. O'Day at John Wayne. I'm his executive coordinator. So Dr. O'Day is at the forefront of research, so I just help manage, make sure he gets to his meetings on time. <laughs> <laughs> Meetings all around the world. Yeah, around absolutely. the world, yeah. Uh, my name's Hunter, I'm from research. I do a lot of the procurement studies, uh, a lot of our investigator-initiated trials. So basically, getting everything that we need to do, that phase zero studies, trying to create the new drones with our drug discovery lab and working on that. Hunter, what does procurement mean? It means basically collecting samples that essentially have been donated to research from patients, uh, everything from spinal fluid to blood to tissue, and then basically trying to aggregate all those different samples together to create a genetic profile to help patients predict their outcome and find new discoveries. So you'll see Hunter in the clinic because he's, he's interacting with the patients to procure these samples, but then it's also overseeing our database where we link how patients do clinically, right? Are they relapsing? Are they responding? Are they living? Are they dying? And, and matching that database with the specimen database. And then our scientists work with these specimens to try to create new science and new discoveries. Someone told me that we have the largest procurement. Um, so we have one of the, probably one of the largest tissue, tissue banks in the world. Yeah, Dr. Morton started um, collecting tissues <laughs> in UCLA back in the 1980s. So this is essentially a 40 year um, tissue bank and blood, so it's blood, uh, tumor, urine, other tissues. It's a very, very valuable resource. Most other cancer centers have not been organized. They, more recently, maybe in the last 10 years, there's tissue banks that have been, but not, rare, I don't think anyone has one quite like this 40 years in, in the making. So it's a huge resource for all of our uh, scientists. And we share this with the world, we, we collaborate all over the world with the specimens, not just here. Sorry, Brenda. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'm Brenda. I'm actually Dr. O'Day's favorite. No. <laughs> no, but I started with Dr. O'Day um, five years ago. Well, I started off as his administrative assistant, and now I've grown into a bigger role, so I pretty much just help the clinic flow. <laughs> Make sure it gets done. <laughs> Thank you. I, to, I would like to add one more piece. Oh, yes, Did somebody else have a question? No. I just okay. wanted to acknowledge social work is here. Yeah, Our registered dietitian is here. Yeah. Um, it really does take a village. It really does. And a happy village. Yeah. A happy <laughs> village. That helps. So, you know, just um, listening to Dr. Day reminds me again. Um, that 22 years ago, almost 25 years ago, I started working um, here at St. John's as a um, oncology nurse, a staff nurse on the unit, inpatient unit. And I remember when Dr. O'Day came, I was brand new here, and we had, all of a sudden, we had all of these stage four um, patients with melanoma that were just so sick and so sad. And actually, not all of them were very sick yet. You know, they kind of looked like, well, I'd be an older one, kind of like you guys, right? <laughs> Just kind of healthy and living their life. And now we're told by, um, by a doctor in another state or another part of the world that they had stage four melanoma. And there really wasn't anything that could be done. And to begin getting ready for the end of their life, you know, within the next six months, perhaps, and that their death I don't think that anybody told them this, but their death is not going to be easy. It's going to be a lot of suffering from that time on. 
And so that was really challenging for, for us as nurses. And then Dr. Day came along and, um, well actually the patients weren't here yet, they came when you came, right? And so um, put in place a uh, program where these patients would receive very intensive chemotherapy for um, a five day period in the hospital called biochemotherapy. And um, it was intense for the patient and it was also intense for us as the staff. And these people would get so sick on, on this um, program and most of them would end up dying. And so it was really, really challenging. And it is amazing now to just see what has happened from that time on to where we are today. And so many patients are doing well. And there's so much hope that surrounds um, melanoma. And not just melanoma, but because of melanoma, as you said, so many other cancers. Um, so it's just amazing to be a part of that. And I bring that up because Right now, we're facing kind of the same situation with our um, patients that have glioblastoma. On the inpatient unit, it's very challenging for the staff to care for these patients, again, who are very young with a, a devastating disease, who are physically a lot of work for the nurses to take care of. Um, but you know, again, we're on the forefront of something amazing, something wonderful, something miraculous, and we're all a part of that. So it's important that we come together and we have these sessions and you get to hear how important you really are. What a difference you make. So thank you everybody. Yeah, I, I just want to thank you. Yeah, I just want to add, you know, I, I sometimes block that out, but you know, <laughs> it's uh, it, was, it was grueling. I mean, really for about 15 years. And Marisol was there we too. We were, yeah, <laughs> where's Marisol? <laughs> for, you know, I mean, the nursing team at St. John's really, it was a labor of love and um, being present and in, in, in a setting of tremendous suffering. I truly did burn out after a period of time and it took a lot out of me. And then, you know, this is such a joyful second resurgence, but I can only acknowledge the suffering that we witnessed and we, we bore witness to in those days. These were young, desperate people. We did cure maybe 10 or 15 percent with these biochemotherapy regimens, but it was it was difficult. And the, the nursing team not only took care of these patients, but we taught other doctors around the country how to do this aggressive treatment safely. So we would bring them in, and our team would, would do that. We were admitting 10 to 15 yeah. a week. So it was a five-day regimen. They'd be admitted on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. The Wednesdays went home Sunday. The Mondays went home Friday. Uh, I had a nurse practitioner at the time, Maureen Martin, who was at our side. And, uh, it's extraordinary, but we knew it was something, but so far from what this is. And uh, I'm just glad we're all here to, to witness that. Lifetime. Because I was seeing four to six new metastatics a week for about 10 or 15. And it's a, as you know, it is, it is tough, tough work to, to be present in those rooms and to see the suffering that is taking place. But now, but in those days, you almost had to see four to six new patients a week to keep your practice level because the deaths were that frequent too. Now our clinic's keep growing because it's just extraordinary. I mean, we do lose, I don't mean to say we don't lose, but you know, it's, it's you know, a handful or two a year that we're losing to metastatic melanoma, literally five to ten, maybe a year, and we were losing, you know, four to six a week or every couple of weeks. So it just shows you where we've come. So I just want to this. You're working at a place that has a history that really is extraordinary, not only for melanoma, but how this has changed cancer, um, because these treatments now are being applied throughout, and you know. So we should just enjoy and work as a team and really acknowledge and, and support each other. Because it still gets tough in the clinic. It's always good to look to, not only to the patients for distress, but your coworkers and understand that some of that can be just what we're dealing with. And you know, be supportive and, and uh, as we go forward. Because we're all, and that means whether you're on the front lines of registration or the back lines, we all get some projection from patients and other staff just of how we're trying to, to manage the day. But overall, it's extraordinary how well we do.
Great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. There's only one thing I want to say. Two things, actually. Thinking about support for each other. So you all got an email today. I haven't seen it yet. That um, Brenda Perlman, she's our um, uh, director of our volunteer program. She's the one that's in charge of the um, positive pause. Anybody know about that? Yeah. Dogs that come to visit patients in the hospital. And they also stop and see the nurses and folks that are working in the hospital as well. But um, we asked her to come to our clinic as well, a couple of times a week, maybe every day if they can, and stop and visit um, the, the patients and family members in the waiting room and then come back into the clinic and see all of us. And So stop for a minute, put your hand on the dog, pat them. Um, just kind of fills you with a moment of happiness. And we're also going to have her come over to the John Wayne and see folks that are working over there as well. So it'll be fun. <laughs> One more thing, then you can go. Um, <laughs> well, the captive audience, right? <laughs> so um, it's time for you all to do your success factors, your self-assessment. Um, so please go ahead and do that, and we'll be reaching out to you um, for us to have a sit-down conversation with each of you one of them. Anybody have anything else to add besides happy Valentine's Day, love day? Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you.